Good afternoon and welcome once again to the 50th annual session or the 50th annual conference on higher education computing in Kansas. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, you are now attending the 215 session uh, and this one is called Raspberry Pi time. This particular session is pre-recorded recorded, and there will not be question and answer afterwards. Um, I do believe there's a slide at the end of this uh, presentation that will give you some uh, contact information um, for the presenter if you have any questions for him. Um, so without further ado, I, um, I think we'll go ahead and start the presentation. Again, it's called Raspberry Pi Time and the presenter is Brian Morgan, who is, uh, he works at ESU and he's, he's kind of a mastermind and jack of all trades. He's just a wonderful guy and a great developer. So without further ado, here is the presentation. Hi everybody, I'm Brian Morgan. I'm an application developer with Emporia State University. My email address is bmorgan at emporia.edu. Please feel free to email me if you have any questions or comments about my presentation. So it's time for Pi, yay! This is the story about timekeeping at Emporia State University. Initially, my director had asked me to do a presentation about how we're using the Raspberry Pi as our time clock system. And when I got to thinking about it, really the pie is just a small piece of the overall story. And I want to tell you the full story so that you can get a context of how the Raspberry Pi fits in. And as that story unfolds, hopefully you can see why it was time for Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to start off by telling you where we're at today, and then we're going to jump back to the beginning of the project where we were at in the very beginning, and then work our way back to where we're at today. And today, our time clocks are a distributed system where there's one time clock at least in every building. Some buildings have more than one. Uh, the Memorial Union actually has five in it. And it's a combination of two-in-one laptops, which is what we initially deployed, and then touchscreen Raspberry Pis, which has been a more recent addition. It's a client-server architecture where the server actually does the majority of the heavy lifting and the client is really only responsible for the user interface. The server um, actually pulls back job information and, and uh, writes records to the banner tables where the client just displays that job information to the end user and interacts with the NFC card readers. And there's really not very much to the client at all. Before this project started, timekeeping across campus was really very bespoke. There were lots of different systems, lots of different processes, and it really varied by department. In IT, when I started in 2005, the administrative assistant for our department would bring our timesheets and stick them up on our door, and we'd fill them out and turn them back into her, and then she would enter all of those by hand into the mainframe system. Eventually, the mainframe system became Banner, but the process never changed. Other departments had time clocks, but they were like the time clocks that you would buy at Costco or Sam's Club. You know, they were just something that was sitting on a desk, paper punch system, and at the end of the pay period, the administrative assistants would take those paper punch time cards and enter those records into Banner by hand. There was no integration at all with Banner other than the people that were manually keying that stuff in. So that was really time consuming and really burdensome on those people that had to do that. The project started out of a frustration with that, that bespoke system that I just talked about. And payroll was frustrated with it. The administrative assistants were frustrated with having to enter time by hand. And so it was time for a change. And so payroll was interested in looking at banner web time entry because it was something that we already owned and they thought it could potentially fit our needs. So we rolled that out in a really limited capacity initially to the payroll group and then to IT. And it worked out really well for us and then payroll decided that they would like to roll that out to the rest of the campus. But that brought up a, 
an important question, which is for the people that have limited access to a computer, how are they going to record their time? And we liked the idea of clocking in and clocking out. So we had thought maybe that we would use banner web time entry with the clock in clock out capability and and maybe set up a kiosk type system where there'd be you know a bank of four or five computers and employees could show up for work sit down log in clock in log back out and then the person behind them could do the same and until everybody got through but really that would be really time consuming and inefficient and it just didn't seem like that would be feasible. So we started looking at products that we could buy to, that would integrate with Banner and do a, a time clock system that way. Um, there's several options out there. Time Clock Plus is probably the one that a lot of people are familiar with. The advantage to buying something is that we would have had a fast deployment but there's going to be higher costs associated with that. You've got your purchase cost, your implementation cost, your ongoing maintenance cost. Any customization that would have to be done would probably be an additional cost. And then you've got your banner integration to think about. To build something, we'd have a lower cost, but it would be a slower deployment. And in the end, you still have to integrate with banner. Um, one thing I would like to mention here is the customization piece of it. And just to give an example of something that we had to grapple with is um, the way Emporia State does shift differential. Any time worked between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. is eligible for shift differential. And if your shift crosses that line, the entire shift is eligible for shift differential. So if I would clock in at noon, clock out at 8 p.m., all eight hours of that would be shift differential pay, not just the two hours between 6 and 8 p.m. But if I were to clock in at noon and then leave at 5 and take an hour break, come back at 6 and work until 11 for, say, a football game or something, then only that time between 6 and 11 gets shift differential because I was clocked out for over a half an hour. So, you know, that's our specific needs but every institution is going to have things like that that they have to deal with. What we realized was that really Banner Web Time Entry did a lot of the stuff that we already needed. Um, it could do clock in, clock out. It had approval workflow and permissions. It has a nice dashboard. It has everything that we need. The only real problem is it's just so slow to use. We needed some way to interface with it that would be a lot faster for people to use. And so we got to thinking, well, maybe what if we could build something smaller that people could interface with that would hook right into web time entry? What if we could reverse web time entry and figure out where it's writing its records to, what tables and, and all of that? Then maybe we could build something that would interface in the same way and then we wouldn't have to totally reinvent the wheel and that's what we ended up doing so the way the application is designed is it's a distributed decentralized system so we've got one or more time clocks in every building and everybody that uses the time clocks uses the same set of time clocks I mean it's not it's not like it was before where every department has their own. We use the same system across the campus. Uh, I had done some work prior to this project with a MagStripe reader reading our ID cards and it emulated a keyboard so that you could program it to do whatever you wanted and output that as keyboard output. So I had programmed this reader to read the employee ID off of the ID card and append a carriage return to that. And we were using that in banner forms so that students could check in for different things and it would they could use that to populate their student ID into a form and then it would automatically hit enter and pull up their record in banner. So I wanted to do the same thing here. That worked pretty slick. 
And I also, I have a background in web development. So I wanted to build something that was a client server set up where there was the server and then each time clock or time station around campus would essentially just be a web browser. And I'd set it up the same way that I had done with the banner forms where it would automatically focus in that field and they could swipe their card and it would enter their employee ID and, and then submit the form. And then the server would in turn look them up and find their jobs and then present back their jobs and they could tap the clock in out buttons and then it would submit that back to the server and the server would write that time in time out record to the banner tables. So we wanted something that was touch screen to make it easy to interface with that clock in clock out um, interface and for the card reader to work we needed something with a USB port which really pretty much eliminated the iPad and other tablets we needed something with network connectivity preferably Ethernet but Wi-Fi would do and it needed to be low cost so that we could have a bunch of stations around campus preferably at least one in every building so some of the things that we looked at and let me preface this by saying that a lot of the hardware and networking decisions were made by a committee and I had initially looked at the Raspberry Pi as a solution but it was dismissed by the committee because it was anticipated that the client services group was going to maintain and take care of these workstations that we were going to use as time clocks and they're most comfortable and familiar with windows so they really wanted something ideally that would run windows and also people that aren't familiar with raspberry pis a lot of times dismiss them as toys or you know something that's fun to play around with but not really a serious tool which I think is really unfortunate because they're being used in a lot of places from manufacturing to medicine but that's the reality that that we ran into and we also looked at some Android tablets but um, didn't really go too far with that and then at at the time that we were doing all this, Asus had just come out with a two-in-one Chromebook that looked really interesting. It had the touchscreen interface. It could fold back on itself and just show the screen. Um, it was low cost, which was important to us. It was around $230, I think. Uh, it had the USB connectivity that we needed. It had Wi-Fi, pretty much everything we needed other than Windows. So we decided that we would try to prototype something on that so while all of this was going on we were trying to figure out the design of the application and and decide on hardware our security group was um, implementing a new door access system and they were switching away from the magstripe reader to a new system called Gallagher which uses NFC and everybody was going to get a new ID card with the NFC chip in it and we decided that would be a good opportunity to explore using NFC for the time clocks as well. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an NFC reader that would emulate a keyboard the way that the Magstripe reader would. I found a, a lot of readers that had SDKs for different programming languages, but I couldn't find anything that would do the keyboard emulation. But I was able to find a reader that would work with Chrome OS as part of a Chrome app like Chrome OS gives you some additional APIs if you build a Chrome app rather than than a web page and so it didn't take a whole lot of work to switch from being a web page to a Chrome app and then I was able to use the NFC reader as part of that so after I was pretty much almost done with my Chrome app, the steering committee decided that the Chromebooks were not an acceptable solution because they weren't enterprise grade and you know we've got a, a contract with Dell and um, they didn't run Windows so we were able to find a Dell 2-in-1 
that was pretty much the same concept we were trying to accomplish with the Chromebook. They were a little bit more expensive. For me, personally, it would have been a lot more expensive, but for Emporia State, I'm going to say a little bit. They were $100 more a unit. Um, the app didn't translate 100%. It, the NFC reader was able to work through Chrome OS to the Chrome app. There was It just worked pretty seamlessly. To get the NFC reader to work on Windows as part of the Chrome app, I had to actually use a special USB driver, which ended up leaking memory like a sieve, and we're going to talk more about that later. So I'm going to switch gears just for a little bit to kind of give some context about future slides and talk about a little bit of resistance that we had on campus. Um, most of the campus was happy about moving to the time clock system. It was going to make life a lot easier for a lot of people, especially the administrative assistants. But some departments weren't real happy about it. Police and safety was one. And the reason they weren't happy about it is because of their overnight shifts. Their overnight shifts actually started at 11 p.m. and end up at 7 a.m. the next day. And let's say somebody clocked in at 11 p.m. on Wednesday and clocked out at 7 a.m. on Thursday, then that entire eight-hour shift would be put on Thursday rather than one hour Wednesday, seven hours Thursday. And I don't totally understand how they were recording time before um, and why this was such a big deal to them, but I guess it, it affected their overtime and their scheduling and all sorts of things like that. So they weren't real happy about it. Um, and for us to move to the time clock meant that they had to record that one hour on Wednesday and then the seven hours on Thursday. Uh, facilities was also not happy about it, and they were actually a little more upset about it than police and safety. And I, the reasoning behind that is because in the beginning, as I mentioned before, they used a centralized time clock system. So everybody was coming in in the morning, and they the management in that department really liked that. They liked everybody coming in. They liked being able to talk to them and get them lined out for the day and making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And there was no question of where somebody was clocking in or clocking out, anything like that. And also they didn't actually clock out for lunch before. Um, what they would do is they'd clock in in the morning, clock out in the evening, and then as the administrative assistant was entering the time into Banner, she'd just take the half hour off of their total time um, for lunch. And so that was, that was a sticky thing. Um, another thing is some people thought that we were using the time clocks to spy on them. They knew that we had the cameras and, and the microphones in the laptops, and somebody started a rumor that we were using the time clocks to spy on people. So I actually went into a janitor's quarters one day to work on a time clock, and I found that they had thrown a towel over the front of it, and they had the radio cranked up real loud, and yeah. So anyway, that was interesting. Um, honestly, we never used the cameras on these things. The next challenge we ran into was how to mount them mount these two-in-one laptops on a wall. There was a lot of concern about theft and tampering, and rightfully so. I mean, um, but we weren't able to find anything off the shelf. We we were able to find some swivel mount things that, that sort of clamped around the sides, but they would be so easy to take a laptop out of that 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 wasn't really a good solution. Um, we had talked to facilities about building something out of wood, but because of lack of buy-in, they weren't really willing to help us out with that. We talked with a manufacturing company here in Emporia called Hopkins. They make ice scrapers and things. We talked to them about doing some plastic injection molding. And when I called to ask about it, the guy that I talked to just laughed at me. And he said, do you even know what that would cost? And I said, no, that's kind of why I'm calling. And he said, well, it'd be at least probably $10,000 just to get the mold made. And so that was not going to happen. 
And we had talked to some machine shops about machining out of aluminum and that, that was too expensive as well. So that brought us to 3D printing. And that's actually what we did. We, we ended up 3D printing frames, but that was not without challenges. Um, first of all, 3D printing was just fairly new to us. And we found out that it took a lot longer than we expected to print each frame. And because we expected that they would print quicker, we, we ended up starting a lot later than we should have to meet our deadline. And as soon as we realized how long it was going to take to print each frame, um, we ended up buying another printer. And I think it was about 24 hours to print one frame. And we needed at least 23 frames. So we had printers running 24 by 7. We had people spending the night. We had to turn down the infill and increase the print speed. And that in turn caused problems when we were mounting them because they ended up with so with so little infill we ended up driving screws like clear through the frame and so that ended up being a, a real problem another big problem was that the printers that we have the build plate was too small to print the frame in one piece so we ended up having to print in four pieces which ended up requiring 10 screws to mount the thing um, two screws per side and then three screws for the top and three screws for the bottom. So IT ended up having to mount the frames um, again due to the lack of buy-in from the facilities group and we had a lot of fun doing it but it's not really what we do day to day so there was a little bit of a learning curve to to get going with it. We ended up having to buy tools and and hardware and um, because we were running so far behind on printing we and, and we were breaking frames we had a few that we just had to set out on desks and tables because we just didn't have frames ready for them yet so this is what we ended up with um, here's the printed frame and you can see hopefully that it's four pieces and then there's four screws, two on each side, and then three across the top. And there's actually three inset in the bottom here. And we got the card reader here and the power supply here, which is secured to the wall with double-sided tape. And because these power blocks actually generate a little bit of heat, it um, has caused over time the stickiness of the tape to go away. So now you'll see these power supplies just kind of hanging from the receptacle. So that brings us to go live. After we went live, we ended up with lots of problems. Uh, the biggest problem was the memory leak from the custom USB driver. That was just a nightmare. And with four gig of RAM, I think we ran out in about six hours, maybe eight hours, just completely ran out of memory. And so to work around that, I set up the computers to reboot every four hours. But that caused problems because occasionally when they would reboot, they would hang and get stuck on the Windows is restarting spinner thing. And if we weren't having those problems, the client application would just randomly lock up. I'm assuming because of the USB driver, I never really was able to figure that out. We had server-side business logic errors. Um, you know, people were punching in when they should have been punching out and vice versa. Just growing pains. One thing that is really embarrassing for me, especially looking back on it because it's just so obvious, I didn't put a clock on the client application. So people were not supposed to clock in more than five minutes before their shift started. And they'd get in there and have no idea what time it was without having a watch or a phone or something because there was no clock on the client. So I think we had been live for like a day and a half before somebody said, hey, we need a clock on this thing. So I just felt so stupid. So we were running around all over campus, restarting these time clocks when they would lock up or get, get hung up restarting. And I knew that this was just not sustainable. So since these 
computers were running Windows, I figured there's a .NET driver for the NFC card reader. I really probably should just go ahead and make a native Windows application. But my background is in web applications, not desktop applications. And so this was all new to me. So when I wasn't running around restarting computers, I was trying to learn as much as I could about XAML and C Sharp and and then I was fixing server side bugs and it was just progress on this new client application was really slow because I was trying to juggle all this stuff. And I don't know how it happened, but one day I discovered Electron and I found a Node.js driver for the NFC card readers and I thought, you know, if I could use this Node.js driver that doesn't require this custom USB, then maybe that would fix our memory leak. And so I got to looking at it and it looked like it would be really straightforward to move from the Chrome app to Electron. So I decided I'd give it a try. I was able to port my application in less than a day and it totally fixed the memory leak and it worked great and it worked so well in fact that I just scrapped the whole idea of building out a new Windows application. And after that things really stabilized a lot. So even though the client application was stable we were still having some problems that were really specific to running on Windows. The first of which is that Windows 10 really wants you to apply the updates. I mean, it's, it's the anti-Windows XP, you know? And if you don't, if you're not there to tell it you don't want to apply the updates, it will just do it and restart. And that's not ideal when you've got an application that people need to use. And it's not ideal when your computers get stuck rebooting. And so it's, there were a few times we would come in in a morning and every time clock on campus was just stuck at the windows is rebooting you know spinner and so that was not ideal also pushing out updates to my client was not the easiest thing to do i i had a couple of choices i could either run it around on a usb drive which is what i did most of the time or i could remote desktop and I hope that nobody needed to clock in or out while I was doing that. Which brings me to my last point, which is that it, uh, remote administration really isn't possible on a Windows machine without disrupting the running application. And that's just not ideal for an appliance type system where you expect 100% availability. So I've been running Linux on the server since the late 90s. Uh, my first job was actually with an ISP and I did a lot of work with Linux there and I've been running Linux on the server and on my desktop ever since so I'm really comfortable with Linux and a lot of the reasons that we chose to, to use Windows in the first place which is that the client services team was going to be managing it it just didn't work out that way in reality in reality, I was so hooked into these machines because of the, well, first of all, the custom USB driver, but then, you know, it was my application that was running and I just felt really responsible for these things. And so I was doing all the management on them anyway. So I wanted to see if I could move from Windows to Linux and it was really pretty easy to get the application moved over because Electron is cross-platform by design. So I I did one just to see if I could do it and it worked out pretty well and what I did was just a minimal OS install. I, I did Ubuntu with like nothing, you know, the minimum minimum install and then I, I installed the X server without a desktop environment so it's just minimal X11 and then that in turn boots up the application so the application boots directly and that's it so I think the whole thing including the operating system and the application was running in 200 mega RAM or something like that 
Also, this gave me the ability to push new updates through SCP and I could restart the application itself over SSH if I needed to, or I could SSH and inspect the logs and do other system maintenance stuff without interrupting the running application. And that's the point that I want to make is that brought me a lot closer to being a true appliance. But after a couple of years, the two in ones started to have some problems. We had three machines within just a couple of weeks where the touch screen failed. Everything else was working fine, but it wasn't accepting input from the touch screen. We had enough uh, spare machines on hand that we could replace those and, and keep running, but it really got me nervous and we started looking at replacements. And so we looked to Dell again for the two-in-ones and uh, we found out that the new two-in-ones are slightly different physical dimension from the original ones that we deployed. So the frames wouldn't work. And those frames were printed to fit like a glove and the new computers are just enough thicker that they wouldn't slide into the frames. So we looked at two solutions. Um, the first, we went back to the wood shop and ask them if they could design a, a frame that would be generic enough that we could fit slightly different dimension machines in the future, but secure enough that we could keep the thing tightly on the wall and not have to worry about tampering. And I had also seen like a smart home system built around a Raspberry Pi that had a nice mounting bracket and it was touch screen and it, it looked like it would be perfect for what we were trying to do with the time clocks. So I looked at that as well and we evaluated those two solutions in tandem. And I found out that the Raspberry Pi was a perfect fit and it, it did exactly what we needed to. It was more than enough hardware to do what we needed to. So Here's what we ended up with. And this is actually one that's in the admissions office. They didn't want it mounted on the wall. They wanted something that, that could just sit on their reception desk. Um, and so this is what we came up with. But this frame here is called Smarty Pie, and it's available on Amazon. Um, the touchscreen is actually the 7 inch official Raspberry Pi touchscreen and then our NFC reader. Here it is from the side. And you can see we've got our, our cables nicely managed up in there. And this is, the base has got uh, some uh, bracing around, along here that you can zip tie to, so that's what we did here. And it really cleaned up the look of it a lot compared to the old system. And it's all self-contained, which is really nice. There's the card reader. So some of the benefits the way I see it is that it's got built-in Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Um, with the two-in-ones, they didn't actually have built-in Ethernet, and we had some issues with the Wi-Fi, and so we ended up having to use USB Ethernet dongles. And that's just one more thing hanging off of there that makes it look not very good. Another benefit is that these can be made totally portable with a 5 volt USB battery pack. Probably my favorite feature is that they're modular. So if the screen fails, if the Raspberry Pi itself fails, power supply fails, whatever, they're all separate discrete components. So, you know, if the screen fails, you just replace the screen for $60 rather than having to replace the entire thing. And even if we did have to replace the entire thing, it's still like a third the cost of a Dell 2-in-1. Another great thing is the long-term availability of the Raspberry Pi. They're still selling the Raspberry Pi 1 on their website. So I'm confident that the Raspberry Pi 3, which is what these are built on, is going to be around for a long time to come. My guess is probably another decade. And if not, that's okay because the form factor between the 
Model the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Raspberry Pi 4 is almost identical, so it really wouldn't be that much to switch it out. Um, so here's the cost breakdown Micro Center has a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus for $25 now that the Raspberry Pi 4 is out. You can get a 7 inch touchscreen, the official one, for $60. You can get a power supply with a switch for $10. You can get the case for $30 from Amazon and Amazon is the only place I have found to buy it. You can get the micro SD card for $7.50 from Amazon and the whole thing comes out to a total of $132.50. Now you could probably bring that cost down even more by buying some things in bulk from Micro Center. I don't know if they have educational discounts or anything like that, but that might be another thing that could bring the price down even more. I'm guessing if you were creative, you could probably bring that cost down maybe another 10 or $15. So as great as the Raspberry Pi is, it's not without its limitations. The Raspberry Pi 3 only has one gigabyte of RAM. It's got a slower processor than the Dell 2 and ones and we had experienced some sluggishness over time with the Electron client, meaning the longer the client was running, it would start to get sluggish after like three weeks of of continuous running. And so one thing I did to work around that was just set it up to restart the application every couple weeks. Not the entire computer, but the application. And restarting the application itself takes like two seconds. So it's not even noticeable. But, you know, that always kind of bothered me. And also, there was a little bit of memory creep with the application as well. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Electron brings Chrome along for the ride. Everything is built on Chrome. And I think that memory growth is due to Chrome caching things aggressively. But I wanted to try to rewrite the client application in GTK I had a feeling that it would fix those two issues with the memory growth and the sluggishness. And so I, I was able to write something up in GTK and it worked pretty well. So I went ahead and wrote the entire client side application out with GTK and it, it works beautifully. So the operating system plus the GTK application runs in less than 90 megabytes of memory. I think it's actually like 87 megabytes or something like that. And it sticks there. I mean, that number never changes. I look at it, you know, 30 days out, 60 days out, 90 days out, and that number doesn't change. So I'm really pleased with that. And also, there's no more sluggishness. It is just rock solid, like run for six months without issues, rock solid. So I've been really pleased. Some things that I'd like to try in the future is power over ethernet to do away with that power supply, clean up the, just clean it up a little bit. And also biometric authentication, either fingerprint or facial recognition. One thing that I have heard about is people tend to forget their cards, their ID cards and without some other form of authentication, they're not able to clock in. And so then the administrative assistants actually have to enter their time for that shift. So what have we learned along the way through this whole process? I think one of the most important things is just use hardware the way it was intended. Those two-in-ones were never meant to be mounted on the wall the way they are. And it, I mean, it works, but it's been a challenge to make it work. Another thing is that it's incredibly beneficial to use a client server model. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, as my story progressed, you could see I went from one client application to another, to another, to another, and I hardly had to change any server code. And server code that I did, did change was not related to the client changes unless there was some new feature request that, that I added. Um, so, and then that allows for flexibility in the future, like we could write maybe a smart phone app or something like that for clocking in. Just 
a lot of possibilities, and uh, I, I've been really pleased with that architectural decision, um, keeping the client as light as possible. Another lesson that we learned is that appliances that require a maximum dependability like this or like medical equipment or, you know, whatever, should be on Ethernet. Don't use Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is great for transient connections. You're coming, you're going, whatever. Something that's going to be in place for a long time should use Ethernet. Another lesson is that Windows is not the best option for these types of devices or appliances. It's arguably not even a good option. Please don't write me hate mail about this. Another lesson, logging is critical. I decided up front, based on experiences in the past, that I was going to log everything, every little interaction on the client side, everything that happens on the server side, everything is logged. And you know, some things are debug log statements, some things are informational, some things are critical. I always have the option to change my log level so that I don't see all those messages, but it's been invaluable to have all that logging for debugging purposes. And the last thing that's really kind of surprising to all of us is that theft and tampering really wasn't an issue. Um, nobody has messed with these things, not even to shut them off or anything. It's just been surprisingly quiet with them, and I'm really pleased about that. So anyway, that's that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I thank you for taking the time to sit with me. I hope that it was entertaining and informational, and hopefully um, you can take some of the lessons that we learned and apply them to things that you're working on. And again, if you want to get a hold of me, have any questions or feedback, my email is bmorgan at emporia.edu. Thanks a lot for listening, and have a great rest of the conference. I just want to say thank you to Brian Morgan for that very interesting and informative uh, presentation. Thanks, Brian. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, there is no live question and answer session for this presentation, but uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and fill out the form and we'll make sure that Brian uh, gets to your questions. And um, so that is the end of this session. We just want to say thank you to all who attended and we hope you have a, an awesome rest of your conference. Bye-bye.